going live. Wait a second. Lisa? Hold on a second. Okay. We're live. You have to go, go and look if it's on. Hold on. I have to let Lisa in. Participants. Admit. Okay, great. Hannah, go ahead. One second. Lisa? Hi, Lisa. Uh, okay, the Rabbi Shmuley podcast. My gosh, I, I hope I'm live. I'm going to make sure I am with Lisa Wade, the author of American Hookup. Um, Lisa, we're together finally after all of these obstacles. It just goes to show you that miracles still happen, even in a crazy 2020 America. Even as the country disintegrates all around us, you and I are here talking, keeping it all together. Right. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. So um, I listen, uh, in my ear, I have my, my daughter, Hannah, uh, who, as you know, runs the uh, koshersex.com and took everything that I uh, created in my books and made it into this amazing company. And she so admires your work. And um, I'm going to make sure that uh, I cover a lot of the ground that's very important to her as a millennial. But let me just introduce this conversation. Um, we thought that during COVID-19, we might see more sex in the American bedroom. We might see uh, more romance because people were locked up and they had nowhere to go. And so many of the distractions that normally uh, upend relationships were now uh, forcibly removed. But we saw the opposite. There's an uptick in applications for divorce. Um, Sex in the American bedroom does not seem to have gotten a lot better. What has increased is watching Netflix or Hulu and all these kinds, uh, all of these distractions. And you kind of predicted it in your book, American Hookup. You focus more on students, what's happening on campus, but you kind of destroy this misconception that there's so much sex in America and the only ones who aren't getting it is us. We, we all think that somewhere else, somebody is like swinging from the chandeliers, but it turns out they're all in kind of like a deep, um, moribund uh, relationship and, and not having a lot of sex. So why don't you talk to us about that? Sure, well, it's, it's generally an interesting thing to think about that what is often presented as culturally true or ideal is actually not re reflective of what most people are doing. So you can um, use as an example, perhaps the idea that we, we in America have a pretty clear idea that there's an order in which you're supposed to sort of follow in your life. So you're supposed to grow up, go to school, um, get married, buy a house, and then have a child or two, right? But we all know that that is actually not normative, or it's not normal in our society. So it's quite normative that, that that's how you proceed through life. But it's not the normal way that most people actually do these things. And in the same way on college campuses, there's this idea that everyone should be having sex all the time, uh, casual sex in particular. Um, but in fact, it's quite rare for students to be very, very sexually active in that way. See, that's crazy. I mean, that is such a shattering of a myth. Okay, so I've been married uh, now for, let me just uh, tabulate quickly. I've been married for 450 years. So someone like me who's married for half a millennium, we're convinced that, you know, that, um, well, let me, let me rephrase that. I write books on sex and I interview and counsel many married couples. And I'd say that the national average one out of three married couples is entirely platonic is probably accurate, certainly from the counseling that I'm doing. So married couples are convinced that young people on campus are just like, how do they even have time to study when they're having sex five or six times a day? And you're telling us that there's no truth to that, right? Your book basically says that one out of one out of three, in the same way one out of three married couples is platonic, you're telling us one out of three students doesn't even have sex in their four years on campus. Is that accurate? So uh, a third of students are reporting that they aren't, they haven't hooked up in, they're not always seniors, but yeah, a third of students report that they haven't hooked up at all. Um, about 10% of students report hooking up quite frequently. And then the, the plurality of students, um, they hook up sometimes, but not all the time. Well, we have to even explore the word hookup. You know, in my book, Kosher Sex, um, which I published 20 years ago, 
and I uh, hook up the word was just beginning to enter the vernacular. So I said there that that hookup connotes the interaction between, uh, say, a, a station wagon and a U-Haul. <laughs> you know, a hookup, it, 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 it's such a uh, an emotionless term. Where did this term even come from? I know what sex is, okay? It, it's a man and woman having sex, penetrative, coitus, sex. I know what uh, making love is. Hopefully that's a lot more than having sex. It's the involvement of the emotions. Um, uh, I know what making out kind of once meant, I guess in the 1950s, Greece, the, the movie Greece kind, kind of way. But what I don't know is what a hookup is. Explain to, to all the people like me who actually watched the asteroid that arrived and destroyed all the dinosaurs all that time ago. Explain what a hookup is. <laughs> Um, well, I can give you a definition, but I'll tell you that even students don't know what a hookup is. Um, so the way I define it as some kind of sexual activity that has no romantic future intent. So it, sometimes students- I love, I, mean, I, I love that definition. A hookup is sex where there is no expectation of emotional input or involvement or, or any kind of relationship future. It doesn't have to be sex. It can be any kind of sexual or sexualized experience. So some students will say that they hooked up with someone after just making out with them. They'll, so all they did maybe was kiss on the dance floor and they'll call it a hookup. Other students would say that that's not sufficient and that they need to do, I don't know, get horizontal. But, um, but the students actually vary pretty tremendously in how they themselves would define it. And then, in, in, and then how they decide whether their various activities actually count as a hookup. And it may be as well that they kind of count some things into the category if they, after the fact, um, quite liked that person. Um, but if after the fact they're a little embarrassed, they might count it out. So it's, um, as you might, you might call it a strategically ambiguous term. Um, my daughter, Hannah, was here and I wanted her to participate in this because, wow, that's, 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 that's a powerful definition. Because, see, for me, sex is best captured in this biblical verse, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and leave his mother. He shall cleave unto his wife and they shall become one flesh. So the idea of this cleaving, a clear sexual euphemism, is to become one flesh. It's this intimate connection. So the hookup is the exact opposite, right? Hookup is sex without feeling. I, I, I have to deconstruct that. So how does, firstly, how does that differ from Erica Jong's zip zipless F, right? Um, I met Erica Jong. Uh, I was supposed to host her at Oxford when I was a rabbi there. Um, I was, uh, fear of flying made such a big impact because when it came out, people were introduced to this idea that, that you can have sex with zero feeling. That's what a hookup is? It's a, it's a zipless F? <laughs> sorry, sorry not to be graphic. I'm sorry to be a little bit prudish, but, uh, I've... well, What's the, what's the difference between a zipless sexual interaction and a hookup, or is it the same thing? Well, so hookup culture does prescribe that these experiences are motionless or meaningless, and students will use both those words, emotionless or meaningless. Uh, but that doesn't mean that every hookup is that way. And in fact, um, most relationships on college campuses that emerge, emerge out of a series of hookups, where at first it was, or it was intended to be non-romantic, and then it became, they became romantic. So there's this disconnect between hookups are supposed to be meaningless and emotionless, but in practice, sometimes they are not that way. Well, okay meaning they're not that way because people are not constructed to have such an intimate experience pressure flesh pressed against flesh and that the, that the the deep dark emotions that sex conjures up can't just be suppressed and can't just be avoided is that what you mean that we're not capable of emotionless sex i'm not saying that i think sometimes it's that those experiences bring up in people those feelings in, in an embodied like biological way. I think sometimes it's because they actually turn out to like one another. So they hook up once, they hook up twice, they're hanging out a little bit and they actually like each other. 
And maybe they wouldn't have had those feelings for someone else they were hooking up with, but in this case, they did. You know, I, I could spend months talking about this. Uh, it, it cuts to the core of my life's work in the field of human relationships about what sex is, why we have sex, what's, what's its purpose. So the Bible has no word for sex. Uh, the Hebrew language has no word for sex. The word is knowledge. Now, uh, a millennial or a college student on campus would almost laugh at that, right? How could you possibly know someone through sex? Well, here we are speaking about hookups that have no emotion, no psychological input, uh, no uh, almost no psychosexual input. It's almost like you're putting your, your body on autopilot and you're you're being driven by hormones alone. And yet the Bible calls this knowledge that you could actually know someone more deeply carnally than even through say a conversation. And that's a crazy concept, right? And yet that's the word in the Bible. And Adam came to know his wife Eve and Abram came to know his wife Sarah. And the idea behind that is, is that sex is supposed to be a real unmasking, that everything we do in life is kind of a little bit calculated. Everything that we do in life is kind of, uh, um, it's, 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 with, it's measured to for the recipient. So if I'm speaking right now, I know that I'm speaking to you and I'm speaking to an audience, so I'm thinking about what I'm gonna say. If uh, an employee-employer relationship, that's a kind of relationship. Uh, in a parent-child relationship, that's a kind of relationship. Sex between a man and a woman who love each other is the only experience where we remove all inhibition. We put ourselves completely on autopilot. So in that sense, it's a form of knowledge because I'm not acting through any inhibition. That's the way it's supposed to be. I feel that the hookup culture is the exact opposite. It subverts that idea completely. Hookups are now about masking my deepest self, making sure that I, my emotions do not really get involved, making sure that I don't connect, making sure that there's suppressing intimacy so that I could be, so it could remain zipless. It could remain disconnected. You just said, sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes it turns out that they might actually like each other. I get it. The possibility of intimacy exists, but not only does the expectation not exist, but you're hoping that it doesn't turn out that way. You don't want to really get to be in a relationship. You just want to have sex. Am I, am I getting that all right? You know, my answer I think is going to surprise you. So I think that most students would say that knowledge does describe what comes out of their hookups, but it's not knowledge of the other, it's knowledge of themselves. They often frame hooking up as a way to learn who they are and what they like. So they're hooking up with another person, but their, their interest in acquiring knowledge is all internal. Give me an example. How, how will a man or a woman learn something about themselves by hooking up in, in an emotionless sexual interaction? What will I learn about myself? So I think a lot of students would say, um, I learn what I like and what I don't like. I That's learn how to assert myself and communicate during sex. I learn um, whether or not even hooking up is for me. I think a lot of students would say that that is a main, a main goal of hooking up. Okay, so the purpose of hooking up is to learn about ourselves as sexual beings. I think some students would say that, yeah. Okay, right, oh, well, that makes sense. But, but I would argue that the deepest kind of knowledge actually comes from seeing ourselves in the reflection of another, where there is intimacy. Can there be great sex without intimacy? Are, kid, are students having, are hookups enjoyable sex? Or is it set because there isn't an emotional component, it's more, uh, more of kind of like being an automaton, more like being very uh, visceral, very instinctual and not very, uh, and lacking the emotional connection, is it bad sex? It depends on the student. So some students are having the time of their lives and they have nothing but positive things to say about the sex and they have all kinds of reasons why they really love it. Um, the plurality of st students would say that they're having mixed experiences and mixed emotions about it. There are some things they like about it and some things not, some kinds of pleasures they're getting and not others. Um, does it, does it break down into gender? In terms uh, of whether they're not, doing it or not? Not as much as you might think. So in that 10% of students, maybe as many as 15% who say they really, really love hooking up, those are both men and women. There may be a few more men, but not, not a huge schism. 
So 15% of stu students say they love hooking up. Okay. And what, what, what are the other percentages? So about 30% uh, are not hooking up at all. And they, they don't have interest in casual sex, but they often also don't have any interest in the kind of parties where casual sex starts. So the kind of huge bashes where there's a lot of drinking. Uh, and then the remainder of students, which are about 45% would say that they like some things about hooking up, but not all things, or um, hooking up isn't their ideal, but they're willing to sort of try it out if that's what the culture is. Let's go back for a moment to, to gender stereotypes that are either accurate um, or they're just antiquated and maybe even sexist. Gender stereotype number one, men are fully capable of hooking up, having one night stands and feeling like absolutely nothing. So that when I'm counseling a married couple and the husband says to his wife, yeah, okay, I did it, you're right, but she meant nothing to me. He actually means it, she meant nothing to him. But for women are not capable of doing that, gender stereotype number one, that they get much more emotionally involved in sex, that because sex is an, uh, more of an internal experience for a woman, as opposed to a man who can treat sex as doing something to someone else, as opposed to a woman for whom it's, it's a sharing of self, that the, that the, 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 this, this, the decompartmentalization of body, and soul or, or heart and body uh, are much more challenging for women. Do you accept that or do you just see that as a sexist stereotype? It's not reflected in my students. Um, my students, both men and women alike, tend to, um, tend, to, tend to want connection and tend to develop feelings for people, even if they don't think it's ideal. The stereotype, though, is alive and well. And I would say that one of the more gendered experiences my students have is because the sexual activity is, is stereotyped as so masculine, uh, there's this assumption that women are bad at it, that women sort of can't hook up without developing feelings. And then what happens is when women do hook up, when they're hooking up with men, the men then assume that the women are develop developing feelings for them. And then they tend to be a little bit stiff army unnecessarily after a hookup in ways that make women feel bad. Got it. So the men believe that women are not really capable of having sex and not developing emotions. So they have sex with these women and then they kind of stiff arm them to kind of show I'm not interested in a relationship. And then the women feel bad about what? Bad about the rejection, but they themselves don't want a relationship. So why do they feel bad? They feel bad for two reasons. One, because not because he's not romantic with her, but because he stops being friendly with her. So they were often friends before and then suddenly he's not her friend anymore. And that just feels bad, period, no matter who you are or what the circumstances are. And they feel bad too, because they recognize that it's a sexist stereotype and that they are being, they are being treated in a particular way, even if they display no signs of being romantically interested. And in a culture where being romantically in interested is stigmatizing, they're being aggressively stigmatized, often for no reason. This is really a fascinating subject because, you know, so I study sexuality more as it applies to marriage and long-term monogamous relationships. You're uh, studying it at a much more uh, elementary uh, level of people who are beginning to experiment at a young age on campus. And it kind of uh, serves as a lens into core sexual, the, the workings of, of, of human sexuality. Uh, so for example, if a man has sex with a woman, you said they were friends before, and can they remain just friends? Is the relationship altered or changed through having sex? You see, I would argue it's a good thing that it is changed by it because if it's not changed by it, that means that sex is really not a big deal. And what I have um, pushed back against in my 30 years of marital counseling is when sex is so not a big deal in marriage that couples are no longer having it and don't work on having it because they have many other forms of interaction. They have communication, they go to movies together, they're raising kids together, who needs sex? And I try to explain that sex is, it's, it is a big deal. It's not nothing, it's a big deal. But if you could be two students on campus who are friends and then you have sex and then it's just like, I don't know, you went uh, out to McDonald's together and, and life goes on as normal, that means it really isn't that big a deal. Do, do you see what I mean? The students, generally tend to believe 
that sex can be either a big deal or not. And even those students that are really interested in hooking up uh, plan to someday have the kind of sex you're talking about, really, really deeply emotional and connected and meaningful sex. I would say it's almost universal that students also idealize that, but they think in college that that's not the right time for that. And the right time is, that it's the right time to do this other kind of thing. So, so they, they want meaningful, intimate sex, but they're going to delay it. And, but does it work like that? Is it like a switch? If you train yourself to hold your emotions back and to have sex, and, and let's face it, sex is a connecting experience. I mean, the fact of sex is that you get naked and getting naked often leads to getting emotionally naked and expressing vulnerability and displaying a part of yourself that very few others have ever seen. So you would think that emotion would naturally flow from that experience unless you consciously suppress it. So can they later just flick on that switch and say, oh, but now I'm gonna let my emotions flow. I'm gonna allow this to become a much more uh, intimate experience or does hooking up get in the way of being intimate later in life? I think, so here I'm speculating a little. I think that um, look, that being able to be emotionally naked, as you put it, is a skill that you have to develop and that students may learn this skill a little later than maybe they did in the 1950s where um, sex was actually quite common amongst students who were quote unquote going steady. Um, I think they may learn that skill a little bit longer. The psychologists I've spoken to, however, don't suggest that emotionally void sexual activity in college is going to cause some sort of serious attachment problems later in life. Those kinds of attachment problems, they say, really happen when you're quite little. Well, I've written, uh, I'm sure when you're quite little, that is gonna have a huge uh, impact, um, obviously, but you know, I've written many books on sex based on many other books of research on sex. And there, there always seems to be a correlation between the number of sexual partners we have before marriage and sexual issues that can develop later. Um, and I always say that there's a number of reasons. First of all, you know what? But I don't wanna, I first wanna hear from you. So what, what, what do you believe? Do you believe there's any correlation between, I don't know, someone having 30, 40 hookups at college and then wanting to settle down and find pleasure and satisfaction in monogamy? I mean, my job is to observe. Um, and I think my answer would be it depends on the person. So I, I really do think it's quite individual. I, 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 I see human beings as having many different potentialities and not all being on a single pathway or having a single set of needs or so you don't see any impact on the hookup culture in people's later lives. There's no real correlation. There's no research on that. Okay. Um, something interesting that you say is that here, the term desperate is the new slut. Now, I don't know if we're allowed to even use the word slut anymore, or if we ever should have used it in the first place. So let's just put that all in, in context. What do you mean that desperate is the new slut? Yeah, so in my book, I argue that there, that hookup culture is causing students quite a lot of harm on campus, but that it's not the hookup per se that is causing that harm. It's the culture around the hookup and the particular kind of hook, hooking up that that culture encourages. And one thing that that culture is very clear about is that you are supposed to be able to separate emotions from sex. You're supposed to. And if you can't, there's something wrong with you. Um, and so I argue that the biggest insult you can get in hookup culture these days is to get be called desperate or clingy or needy or thirsty. These That's are the incredible. things you do not want to be. And so um, that is actually quite harmful because for the students that can separate emotions and sex or the students who do develop emotions for someone in the process of hooking up, then they feel like there's something wrong with them and it's embarrassing. And that does cause quite a bit of harm. Well, that's an incredible statement to make. Uh, what, you know what you're saying that if it's if if it is the case that if you become clingy, which would seem kind of natural, meaning 
well, clingy is a pejorative. So let me rephrase this. It would seem to me that it's natural that when you experience the closest physical proximity to another human being that we are capable of on planet Earth, that you might actually feel something <laughs> for that human being, that if you demonstrate that you are seen as desperate, desperate is the new slut. Uh, and by slut, I guess you mean, what is it? I mean, because desperate for me reeks more of, oh, so unsexy. They're just desperate. They're just stay away from that woman or that guy. They're just, um, they're incapable of showing the maturity of disassociation. They can't really disconnect. That's desperate. But slut means someone who's loose. No, I mean, why is desperate the new slut? I don't quite understand it. Well, in the sense that it used to be that the worst thing you could get called was slut on college. Oh, okay, okay. But today that is it, it. it's still I got it. I got it. and they apply it to specific in the same things. way that before the worst thing you could be called was slut which meant that you had no morals you had no self uh you had no self-respect um and you were just loose now the worst thing you could be called is desperate which is that you have sex and you actually get attached is that right yeah that you're somehow weak and you're needy you're not self-contained as a person um you can't you can't you're like emotionally, uh, almost emotionally promiscuous. Like uh, you still have help, but have all these feelings. That's uh, that's an amazing thing that you're saying. I have to say because you know, again, I've written a lot of books on sex. I've counseled thousands of couples. I, I just I find it astonishing to hear that on the American campus, if a man or a woman, but I'm going to guess that it's maybe women more, who are more inclined in this way if you actually show some kind of emotional attachment that you actually care about the person, that you're punished for it with this term desperate, which means that you're a loser, that um, you're, you're, un, you're emotionally immature, or as you said, you're not a self-contained person. I, I find that just shocking. And, it, and it, it would kind of lead to the conclusion that it's better not to have hookups at all. The hookups really are kind of um, I know that you're looking at, at the data and the research so that you're reluctant to draw conclusions about as to consequences, which I respect. You're keeping it very professional. That's cool. Um, I'm different. <laughs> I try to look at the consequences of all of our actions and, and social trends. And I would say that based on what you just said, which is very insightful, that the consequences of the hookup culture are pretty catastrophic. Now, I know that that's kind of predictable coming from a rabbi. Oh, of course. So the rabbi says we shouldn't be having sex out of marriage. Oh, you know, what a revelation. But I'm looking at more as, wow, if because the natural um, corollary of everything you're saying that we should not be desperate by not feeling is that we have to learn to have sex and suppress our emotions. And that doesn't seem that natural to me. It's not terribly natural to most students on campus, both male and female alike. Are the and guys, and the, and, and the men are also called desperate? The men often can, they get called desperate less often, not because their behavior is different or their feelings are different, but because it's simply more believable that a man isn't interested in sexual behavior in a romantic relationship. So even when men and women act identically, still there's this assumption that it's the women who want relationships and it's the men who don't. But you don't believe that, so you don't, you don't believe there's any correlation between the hookup culture on campus and the growing absence of sex in the American marriage. You don't see any, you would say there's no data on that? Yeah, I would say there's no data on that. What if I were to make the argument that if you teach yourself to have sex without feeling, it's hard to unteach yourself that? I think that's fair, that you've developed a set of skills that don't translate very well. And I think students do recognize that um, sometimes they're going to have to make, like, build up those those skills too. Now, in other words, I'm always looking at. You see, I, I approach the whole sexual field from a traditional perspective, but as someone who uh, was never preaching to or writing for a traditional audience, I was writing for a mainstream secular audience. I was the rabbi at Oxford University for eleven years, and I saw so much of this hookup culture, albeit 
I, I won't say it was in its infancy back then because I was I was at Oxford from eighty eight to ninety nine. Um, it was never its infancy was you would probably say is maybe late fifties, early sixties. Okay. What I will what I will say is it it was not as discussed um, as it is now. Um, certainly, um, I don't think people were bragging about being part of hookup culture the way they are today. But I do see certain consequences, and I saw and I believe I saw them on campus. Um, I th I remember men coming to me and saying to me, "If I sleep with one more woman, I can't even look at myself in the mirror anymore." And what they meant by that was not that they had lost respect for themselves, but rather they recognized this, this isn't what they wanted. They thought they wanted it. They thought they wanted to bet as many women as possible and brag about it to their friends and experiment as much as possible and try this and try that. But they later discovered that really they were kind of intimacy seekers, that they really wanted to connect with, they wanted to be known to a woman more deeply. And they felt that they were compromising their capacity to achieve that by making sex so superficial. So I didn't have a lot of students who said, I, I fear that if I keep doing this, I'm not going to be able to bond with someone later. But I did have quite a lot of students who thought they were going to like hookup culture and didn't. And so when, what, you, we, what we do see in the data is that over time, over their four years in college, they tend to hook up less and less and less the further they get along. They, so many students who are opting out, who aren't opting out of hookup culture at the beginning of their, of their campus life, they, by the time they're, they're a junior or a sophomore sometimes, or a senior, have actually opted out. Well, that's, that's pretty fascinating. Why do you think that is? I think it's for the exact same reason you said, is that they discovered, first of all, that um, separating sex and emotions wasn't as easy as they thought. I think they get into their experiences and they, are, and they realize that sex without emotions isn't as much fun as they thought. So they actually find that just being treated kind of coldly just isn't pleasant no matter what they're doing. And so they don't like it very much. Uh, they find that the sex itself is not that pleasurable um, or they feel discriminated against. So women and people of color and people um, from working class backgrounds often feel like they're low in the erotic marketplace and that they're treated badly because of it. So wow. they are out for a lot of different reasons. Low in the erotic marketplace. Wow, I like that expression. So in other words, our culture has a certain, put certain value on, put certain erotic value on different kinds of ethnicities or we certainly, yeah, I mean, body weight, age, all that stuff. We know that there's an erotic value, but you were saying even in ethnicity. ethnicity. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so generally white students are seen as the most attractive with some exceptions. Um, we tend to fetishize the sexuality of black men and Asian women. So black men, Asian women, and white men and women tend to be placed at the top of this erotic hierarchy. And for white men and women, that's a pretty neutral or positive experience. For black men and Asian women, it's not bad to be desirable, but they often feel like they're to tokenized or fetishized um, and seen as erotically valuable because of their race, which is not necessarily a positive experience. And then for students who are at the bottom of that racial erotic hierarchy, um, you know, they are very aware of what's going on. And that also can be a really unpleasant experience and just another kind of discrimination that they have to deal with. Wow, this is fascinating. Are you at liberty to say who is seen as at the bottom of it? Yeah, so well, one of the reasons that we fetishize Asian women is because we tend to feminize Asian people. So Asian women are seen as hyper feminine. And on the flip side, one of the reasons that we fetishize black men's sexuality is because we tend to think about black people as masculine. And so Black men are seen as hyper-masculine, extra-masculine. So the flip side of that is if you're an Asian man, you're seen as insufficiently masculine. And if you're a Black woman, you're seen as insufficiently feminine. And because um, the, we, we tend to gender sexuality, those people end up generally at the bottom of the hierarchy. What about what, that's, that makes sense to me. I think that's very insightful. Um, I think you're a very insightful woman. It's actually a pleasure speaking to you. Um, gosh, I'm learning a lot. I really am. I'm sure everyone watching is as well. And I'm someone who thought he knew a lot on the subject. <laughs> but the truth is with every passing day, you know what uh, the, um, you know, the famous story of uh, 
Socrates when the Oracle of Delphi said he was the wisest man in the whole world. No one ever said that about me, by the way. But when they said that about Socrates, he laughed and he said, it's because I'm the only one who knows that he doesn't know. So with every passing day, I learn more and more about what I don't know. There's also a Kabbalistic expression from the Bible of Kabbalah, Zohar, the Zohar that says that the, the pinnacle of knowledge is to know that you don't know. So a lot I don't know, but I'm learning a lot. So where do white men fit into that erotic spectrum of value? White, white, women, white, white women, I get, I get. you say they're kind of at the top. Asian women, you said are kind of at the top. Uh, African-American men, you said are kind of at the top. Where, where are white men? White men are at the top of the erotic hierarchy as well. And they're often also at the but, top. As much as black men? Um, yeah, I would say I would put those four groups at the top um, for sure. I, I don't know if I, if I can parse them in any greater detail, but, but but white men are also on the top of the social hierarchy. So they usually also have greatest access to like the kind of places where you can throw big parties where hooking up happens. And then that gives them the power to kind of decide what kind of parties get thrown and who gets to come in. And so even if black men tend to be quite fetishized, um, in terms of their potential sexual prowess, white men still generally control like sort of the social spaces in which hooking up happens. And they decide who gets to come and be a part of that. Where do rabbis rank? <laughs> I, know. Rabbis I, know, like, I know. I know you're going to say we're at like rank bottom. <laughs> I know you're like, oh, sorry, you guys don't even make the list. My, my my wife is here watching, agreeing and nodding her head and saying, um, well, I've taken a lot of your time, but I'm not yet. Let me just look what time it is. You got to give me five more minutes because I'm finding this so interesting. The book is uh, uh, American Hook, Hookup. It has so much valuable information in it. How many years did you did it take you to do this research and write the book? about five years. I did three waves of data collection where I asked students to write diaries for a full semester of their first year of college. Uh, so I did three years of data collection, a couple years of writing. Why am I looking to a, at a giant uh, Tulane banner? Because I work for Tulane. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> but uh, is, is it also your alma mater? It is not. Okay, what's your alma mater? Uh, undergrad, I went to University of California, Santa Barbara. I got a master's degree in human sexuality at New York University, and then my PhD in sociology at University of Wisconsin. Oh, that's great. Um, are you guys having Zoom classes now or real classes? Tulane is in person and doing a really wonderful job. We are testing our undergraduates twice a week, and our positivity rate is less than 1%. I'm guessing that uh, COVID-19 has killed off the hookup culture. I got, I got my permission to start collecting data on just that question yesterday. So I'm gonna find out. You know what, let me reverse that. I actually don't believe it's killed the hookup culture. I think young people don't give a damn. I think they really don't care. I think they're convinced even when it comes to sex. Wow, I mean, it's one thing when you go to a bar and you get smashed and all your friends are drinking and you're breathing on each other but you convince yourself it's outdoors or, but you still believe I'm young, it's, I have no pre-existing conditions, I'm not around my grandparents anymore, I'm now on, on, on campus. But I would say that even when it comes to sex, which is so much more intimate and the possibility of transmission is so much higher, I bet that even then they don't really care. Am I, am I, am I wrong? Well, my hypothesis is that we're gonna see the same range of reactions on campus as, that, as we're seeing across America. So I think we're gonna see even more polarization of students before the, the coronavirus came, there were students that didn't hook up or party at all, who were just very interested in studying. And we saw students who were incredibly reckless with their sexual and partying behavior. And I think we're gonna see that same kind of split, but even maybe more extreme. Wow, and you'll be able to study that. Are you the first person that's gonna be studying sex on campus during the coronavirus? I don't know. Well, the whole idea of being on campus is that they feel that they're in this bubble and they can be probably even more reckless. Look, most young people that I know don't care about the coronavirus um, or they're a little bit indifferent because all they hear on the news day and night is that uh, they, they, they will probably, not only will they not be uh, made sick by it, they'll probably be asymptomatic. Their main concern was not to infect their parents or their grandparents. So when they were home, they were careful. 
now that they're at college, they're not careful at all. Why should they be? Because they think it's just, and I guess it's their professors who end up <laughs> paying the price. Um, but my guess is that they're not gonna care that much about when it comes to sex as well about, about transmission, but I'd be fascinated to hear. Let me, let me ask you two more questions. Firstly, um, how has Me Too affected, you know, it's funny, we, we've gone through so many crises in America over the past few years, we forget that let's say two years ago, Me Too dominated uh, the headlines. Now it's the coronavirus. But how has that affected the hookup culture on campus? When you ask students about consent, they often genuinely say that it matters to them a great deal. And they can describe to you in pretty great detail what getting consent looks like. But in practice, um, they tend to resort to the just same scripts where there's very little, if any, clear efforts to get consent, to, to ask for consent. So hookup, or so sex on college campuses, even before the Me Too movement was um, very, relied more on scripts uh, and, you know, implied consent than actual consent, even those students do know. So I think that they're, Awareness of the importance of consent is probably greater than ever before. I think there is probably some men who are a little bit more nervous about how their behavior is being perceived by women, but I wouldn't expect that much change. Really? You don't think that these uh, alcohol parties at fraternities, sororities, you don't think that kind of stuff is gonna change with the fears that students have that they might be accused of something? You would think so, but these groups on college campuses, the white men who control these parties um, have had such immunity from, um, from consequences for so long. I mean, just think about how fraternities around all across America prior to the coronavirus were having huge, huge parties where they were serving underage students drink alcohol and everyone in the community looks the other way. Like the police don't come and say, you're serving underage people alcohol every Thursday, Friday and Saturday night, all semester long. Everyone just kind of like has, we just have this like, we've made this decision that that law, that those kinds of people are allowed to break that particular law. So I think these groups have enjoyed so much freedom from oversight for so long um, that that they're a little bit immune to, to the perception that there might be consequences. Now, I think actually, you know, if there's a fraternity member watching, he probably feels much different, much different than that because they do get a lot of, they're, they're given a lot of rules for how to behave, but many of those rules are broken by a lot of people a lot of the time. So you're saying the Me Too movement didn't have, didn't bring any major change to campus? I haven't collected data specifically on that, but that's, that would be my impression. Okay, and finally, um, well, this is more of a philosophical question. So you've done all this research. What is your belief about the future of mon monogamous relationships amidst the growth of the hookup culture? So the hookup culture is not monogamous at all. The whole idea is not to be monogamous. The whole idea is to experiment as much as possible. You said uh, rightly that a lot of people are gonna think that they're learning a lot about themselves during, during hookups, what they like, what they experience. Um, I would actually argue, I actually think they're becoming more ignorant of themselves through all of this because I think that they're bearing, uh, suppressing, um, um, their own real emotional needs as they use sex as an escape. But that's just me. How do you think, are you a believer after seeing all this in monogamy? Do you think monogamy is still something that works? And I ask that as someone who is watching, you know, I love going to Iceland, can't go now with coronavirus, but I've been there many times. Iceland and the Scandinavian countries live in a post-monogamous world, as you probably know. They don't really believe in monogamy anymore. They believe in, in um, serial monogamy. So they believe that in the same way that students on campus want to have a lot of sex with a lot of people to learn more about sex or about themselves, 
they believe that we're not wired to be with one person and be passionately sexual for three or four decades. We're wired to be with many people. So, but we also want intimacy and we also want stability and children can't have 10 fathers or being raised, you know, in a, they can't be raised in a commune. So they have serial monogamy. They go into a relationship without marrying, but it's exclusive for four or five years. And then they expect the ambers of passion to begin to subside. And at that moment, without any heartbreak for either party, because they expected it to, to, to wane over time, they'll move on. Um, and that's the best of both worlds, you know, uh, in a place like Iceland or Denmark or, or Norway, where this is becoming more common. You just expect that, that, that monogamy will last for about four or five years, eight years, and then and you have children. And then you go to the next one and there's no, there's no fighting. There's no rancor. There's no animus because there wasn't this death till death do us part thing. Do you think that the growth of the hookup culture is a fundamental refutation of monogamy or human beings as being monogamous? Do you have belief in the future of monogamy or do you think this is kind of sounding the death knell for it? If you look at the long stretch of history, if you go back far enough, you see this moment where sex and love and marriage were all together in one place. And that over the decades, we've been teasing apart sex and marriage to the point where um, when I was growing up in the 1990s, um, you know, the idea that you could be have sex outside of marriage was completely and totally normalized, right? But there was still this idea that sex was, should be loving. There should sex and love were still together. But over the, the decades since then, I think sex and love have been being teased apart in the same way. So now we have these three separate ideas that used to be one um, and are now fragmented. And I think that the consequence of that is going to be that students are that people. I'm used to talking about students, that people will be, have this ability to decide for themselves which ones they want to stitch together and how, if at all. So I see a diversification of how people form relationships and think about the, those things over time. And I don't know if that's good or bad. I do think it's confusing. Um, you know, oftentimes having choice choices is is hard, um, but I, that's where I think I see things going. Well, that's fascinating. Sex, love, and marriage were once all together, or at least we pretended they were together. We don't know how much sex there was in these marriages. Um, and then we decoupled marriage and sex. And as you said, in the 1990s, sex outside of marriage became completely normal. Now we've even decoupled love from sex. So the three exist as uh, coexistent uh, universes that don't necessarily intersect. And you would say that its future is to remain that way as three different separate things that need not overlap? Boy, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> history is- you said, No, because you, no, you did say that the longer people stay at college, the less they hook up because maybe this emotionless kind of sex, it, it becomes a little bit empty. I think or, most- or, 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 or do I sound too much like a rabbi saying that? Is that a fact or is it just, is it what religious people want to believe? That I, sex without marriage becomes an empty experience. Or uh, what's it called? You know, you know, Woody Allen famously said, um, what did he say? Yes, sex without love is an empty experience, but as empty experiences go, it's it's one of the best. I, I know all the humor about, uh, about this, but you seem to be saying that as time goes on, students are hooking up less and less. Yeah, so so students, you know, they, they, they come into college culturally believing that that this casual sexual environment is going to be great. Um, they often find that it's less pleasurable and enjoyable than they thought. So they hook up less and less over time. Often this is very much because they, they realize that they would rather have some feelings involved. But they also still idealize this, this situation where sex, love, and marriage are together. Most of them still want to get married someday. Most of them still want monogamy in their marriages. And most of them are really, really 
I mean, it's very important to them to someday have sexual experiences that are intensely loving and intimate. So we still, I think, idealize the, th the three things going together, but there is, but not during the college experience. During the college experience, they've decided that's the time where you're supposed to do something else. Experiments. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, well, what can I tell you? I, um, I found this to be a fascinating, where do people buy your book? I know what the answer to that is, but I want you to say it. Where do people find American Hookup? Oh, they can buy it anywhere. Um, it's published by W.W. W. Norton, so you can certainly find it there at that website, but you can find it on at all the places they sell books. How's the book doing? Oh, very good. Yes, very good. So Lisa Wade, the author of uh, American Hookup. Lisa, I've learned a lot. I, I really enjoyed this conversation. I think your research is extremely important. I think it's going to teach. I hope young people are going to read it. I hope students are going to read it. Do you find students reading the book? Yes, a lot of students are reading the book. I talked to a student recently who said it was her Bible freshman year. Okay, well, until our next conversation, thank you very much. Um, while I would say that no, normally that hookups are not the most kosher sex, <laughs> um, your book is, uh, is uh, wow, extremely insightful. So God bless you, stay safe. Um, we'll have to reconnect in a few months uh, on Zoom, and I'd love to hear the outcome of your research on COVID-19 and campus sex. That's going to be fascinating. Yes, where, do you, where do you plan to publish that? Oh, I don't know yet. Uh, I, I'm just going to start collecting data to see what I find. Because in places like England, as you probably saw, in England, I think it's actually illegal to have sex with someone right now that's not part, that, who you're not intimate with before. So, but there's no such laws in the United States, not yet, right? To my knowledge. Not to, right. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. Great luck with the book. God bless you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Okay.